I was just reflecting on my time at Oshiega Music Festival, and hands down the highlight of the entire weekend was when the Flaming Lips performed Do You Realize? Being their most recognizable track, it's the goosebump inducing moment of the show where time sort of slows and the entire crowd begins chanting along with the bittersweet ballad. In the world of psychedelic music, the Flaming Lips have firmly rooted themselves as both pioneers and disruptors, a result of their bold experimental journey. I mean, thanks to them, MGMT's Oracular Spectacular and Tame Impala's Inner Speaker would go on to share the same producer. But whenever the Flaming Lips become the topic of discussion, it's surprising that most conversations seem anchored to just these two albums. Because once you dive deeper, the band's evolution is pretty impressive. From grunge-era one-hit wonders, they gracefully transitioned to a mainstream psych-pop ensemble, and then boldly ventured into progressive rock and beyond. And while their peers have all had their moments in the sun, not many can boast the consistent quality and zest for reinvention that the Flaming Lips have demonstrated for over four decades. Although I've always appreciated psychedelic music, I admit that I haven't given the Flaming Lips the attention they deserve. And I don't think I'm alone. Considering their longevity and their consistent release of standout records, it's strange that they've managed to stay slightly under the radar for some. The Flaming Lips are a band that, frankly, we don't talk about enough. In the early years, the Flaming Lips navigated through several unnoticed albums, but it took a quirky song about Vaseline to finally jolt the world into paying attention. With their first three albums, the Flaming Lips incorporated more of the rough experimental elements of noise rock. Over the course of their next three records, they'd begin to transform into the band we better know today. They began working with producer Dave Fridman, frontman Wayne Coyne began singing in a higher, more strained voice, pivotal member Stephen Dross joined as their new drummer, they signed to a major label, and they'd finally score their first major hit. The nonsensical novelty that was She Don't Use Jelly was to the flaming lips as Creep was to Radiohead. It's still the lips' highest charting single to date. We would most nights start to play and wouldn't be the entire audience, wouldn't be there yet, but the audience would there would absolutely hate us. And there's a certain energy you get from that kind of hatred and it's, it can be quite fun to play to people that want to kill you and it gives you a kind of a power. But we would play She Don't Use Jelly even to that audience and they would even in the flow of their, <laughs> their hatred, they would say, oh, well, we like that one, you know, and then we'd play the next song and they'd go back to being outwardly hateful. And who knows what, what the reason is why one, you know, one little thing. Um, and then, of course, Beavis and Butthead. How come he keeps singing about these people he knows? <laughs> Who gives a rat's ass? The band was soon featured on some popular television shows, which led to more attention, which led to more touring, and eventually a follow-up record that didn't quite capture enough attention, but would become a cult favorite. A decade into their careers, the Flaming Lips are becoming grunge-era one-hit wonders, bored with creating their style of music. Then their guitarist departed from the band. So they had to evolve almost out of necessity, and decided to experiment by making their next album as difficult to listen to as possible. Track number one. This is CD number one, number two, number three, and number four. Wayne Coyne had begun conducting parking lot experiments, where 40 cars played his music simultaneously over their stereos. This idea of music being played on multiple channels culminated in Zurika. A lot of press called the Soft Bulletin, the album that would follow, to be the band's biggest shift in sound but Zurika was truly the band's significant transition point. Arguably their most beautiful sounding record thus far, they had gone full neo-psychedelia, but it was a four CD album that was meant to be heard by playing all four CDs in four separate CD players at the same time. These are four CDs that are meant to play all at the same time. And it's insane. It's, it's insane. Did you think it was a good idea at the time? At the time, I wanted it to be 100 CDs. <laughs> I thought it could be 100 CDs that you play all at one time. And then I was sort of, little by little, talked into it maybe being 20 CDs, which I thought was a, was a horrible compromise. And that would seem to, we talked that down to maybe 10 CDs that you'd play at one time. And Warner Bros. finally agreed to do four CDs that would all be played simultaneously at the same time on different 
at the time, CD systems that had their own speakers and everything, which is utterly absurd. It's like they were trying to ensure only a few people would really get to experience it. But if you manage to set that all up and sync it just right, you essentially create an arena-like surround sound in your bedroom. There's even a warning label on the cover suggesting that it might cause the listener to become disoriented. It's the type of gimmick you'd expect from King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard today. It's just unfortunate that there's not a full mix available outside of a few YouTube mashups because there are some pretty great moments on this record. It was a fun experiment in theory that freed them from simply being a rock band, but it put them at risk of being dropped from their label. Commercially, the Flaming Lips needed a win. The Soft Bulletin would be the commercial hit the band needed. It would effectively break them through to the mainstream and had critics labeling it as the pet sounds of the 90s, thanks to its combination of harmonies, psychedelic sounds, and orchestral music. You have to remember that an orchestra is never perfectly in tune. So we figured out if we detune these keyboards from one another, that would help achieve like this sort of, this sound that didn't sound as phony as just plugging a keyboard in and playing the horn lines, but at the time, we, you know, I wanted to imagine there was a big orchestra playing. The album arrived at a time when listeners were looking for something new in their rock music, and the soft bulletin was refreshing. They'd brighten up the experimental sounds of Zurika to produce a lush and layered symphonic style with more serious and thoughtful lyrics. It's just too It was also the first time they'd use a digital audio workstation, freeing them to add as many layers as they wanted to their compositions, making them sound absolutely massive. And while they had distanced themselves from the noise aspect of the band, they thankfully kept those dirty and punchy drum sounds. You can see where, I, where at which point I went to Japan and saw Flaming Lips live, and then went back and recorded Lonerism. The drums sound like that. Like you can, you can, you can hear. It changed everything for me uh, with drum sounds. Suddenly, I just wanted all my drums just to be completely blown out. So I mean, like a big part of me going to Dave Friedman was like, I want that drum sound. You know, he's the one that mixed in a speaker and lonerism. I'd be uh, remiss if I didn't mention his name in all this because he was, he, it's um, his production that led to that drum sound. The Soft Bulletin is a testament to the Flaming Lips' profound artistic evolution. The band were simply exploring sounds and recording techniques that were new to them. Staying signed to a label wasn't really a priority. I think we also thought that the record would come out and go, dip, dip, gone, you know, it would get some small review in Rolling Stone and and people would, would forget about it and we'd get dropped from the label and that'd be it, you know? You know, as that year went after it came out, you know, you, you started to feel like, hey man, I think people really like it. It kept going and kept going. Man, we were really surprised with, you know, we saw at the end, end of 99, it was all these, all these lists and, you know, a lot of these people were saying it was one of the best records of the year and it just gave us a whole new life, you know? The album was just a moment where emotional vulnerability intertwined with bold musical innovation and the Flaming Lips were just getting started. If the Soft Bulletin was the pet sounds of the 90s, Yoshimi Battles the Pink Robots was the Sgt. Peppers of the 2000s, a vibrant orchestral concept record that isn't actually much of a concept record. Let's start with the album's titular character, who's based on a friend of the band. Member of the noise band Boredoms, Yoshimi Piwe lent the band some recordings of her savage singing style. The lips then began sprinkling Yoshimi's voice into an instrumental they had arranged to sound like some kind of machine. When Steven and I went back into the control room, Dave Fridman, you know, said something to the effect that that sounds like Yoshimi, who's screaming and doing all the karate chop sounds, is either having sex or being killed by a giant robot. And then I think I said, well, it would be a pink robot, wouldn't it? This observation would influence the entire direction of the album. With something of a sci-fi concept and the band seeking to blend robotic and soft elements, it sparked the creation of the next several songs for the album. With improved songwriting and a new proficiency in studio technology, the band embraced a crazier psychedelic pop sound. <laughs> We were listening to Missy Elliott. We were listening to all this crazy stuff that we had no idea. How are they making these f records? They were f 
crazy. I mean, we'd made a lot of rock type records and we'd made a lot of like weirdo alternative experimental records, but we never had made like hip hoppy pop type records. We didn't have a pop producer. We just thought, well, let's just fuck around and see if we can do it, you know, not do it to be pop, but do it because we were really loving those sounds. And Dave Fredman, he's a great producer like that. You know, he loves all, all music, you know. Um, so we just started to make our own version of what we thought were like Timberland sounding stuff. You know? <laughs> Timberland, we sing a dangle. We so tight that you get our styles tangled. But any sort of a concept within the record is really only evident in the first few tracks. And the band's frontman, Wayne Coyne, has clarified that it wasn't intended as a concept album. Yoshimi is depicted as a disciplined, strong, and determined figure who is prepared to fight against the threatening robots for her own survival and the survival of others. And with part two being fully instrumental, it appears to be the theme music during Yoshimi's battle against said robots. While not all the songs directly link to this faint narrative, the idea of the pink robots can be seen as virtually any sort of obstacle one must overcome. Outside of those few tracks, the album is connected by songs that touch on themes of self-reflection, love and loss, and existentialism. Do Yoshimi is the album that gave us Do You Realize, a track that has become something of a spiritual anthem, used in everything from commercials to films. The album brought even more success to the Flaming Lips, becoming their first gold certified record and surpassing the commercial achievements of the Soft Bulletin. The album's closing track even snagged the group a Grammy for Best Rock Instrumental Performance. This record remains one of the band's most iconic and popular albums, showcasing a modern take on psychedelic sounds with rich production and a mix of introspective and uplifting themes. Not only was it a fresh take on neo-psychedelia, but it reflected the warm and melodic direction of the genre's next generation. What, what do you think it is about that track, Time to Pretend? Um, it's probably the, um, the, uh, the repetition of it, yeah. The, uh, the infectious production by Dave Fridman. Yeah, the infectious atmospheric production. I think now's a good place to talk about producer Dave Fridman, whose first album ever produced was the Flaming Lips 1990 album In a Priest Driven Ambulance. Since then, the band have been nearly inseparable when it comes to crafting studio releases. Over the years, Fridman would also produce records alongside bands like Slater Kinney, Mogwai, and Lowe leaving him to become known as the Phil Spector for the alt-rock era, strictly in regards to musical influence. Fridman became known for his use of tension and release, working on albums that envelop you in their sound, as well as exploring unconventional recording techniques. And because of that, when artists like Tame Impala or MGMT come along looking for a producer to aid them in creating dynamic walls of sound around their unconventional ideas, they call Dave Fridman. As far as I see it, Fridman is an unofficial member of the Flaming Lips, and they'd certainly need his help following Yoshimi because the record after a commercial breakthrough is always a tricky prospect. The Yeah, Yeah, Yeah song is a very strange song. Even when we made it, it only took us a couple of days. A lot of times our records, our songs will take even, a, you know, a couple of weeks to do. And that's only, it only took us a couple of days. And it was very, still very strange. I think almost slightly annoying sort of song, but um, <laughs> you know, I mean, we, we sort of, we're not in full control of our, you know, what sort of erupts out of us. At War with the Mystics was the highly anticipated album arriving almost four years after Yoshimi battles the Pink Robots, when everyone was entering their punk phase. While seen by some as less inventive than previous albums, the band seemed to be having fun paying homage to 70s rock. It retains their psychedelic flair, but brings a new pop rock hook heavy sound, incorporating genres like funk, soul, and elements of progressive rock. <laughs> It's a fairly playful and melodic record, so if you're not in that mood, I could see how some tracks may come off a bit annoying at moments, but with that said, I still think it's their most underrated and overhated record. It houses some of their catchiest tracks, some of the band's best riffs, and arguably their best cover art today. It even won our boy Dave Fridman a Grammy for Best Engineered Album. It's a colorful and epic bag of musical styles, so you're bound to find something on here that captures your attention. 
But for those that feel like it lacks the creativity of their previous two records, or for those that can't get into the albums of this lush orchestral phase, the band was about to head into a new direction. Tame Impala had just released his Acid Rock EP, MGMT were bringing psychedelic pop back to the airwaves, and Animal Collective had just completed an impressive run of playful psychedelia. Neo Psych was thriving, and the Flaming Lips were about to contribute to the genre in a big way. Pushing past pop-friendly tunes, Embryonic is a result of spontaneous jam sessions between Coin and Drost. An 18-track odyssey that explores a number of sonic textures, it's an acid rock epic that's more aggressive and darker than almost anything that came before. Previously, the band had always had the dilemma of which songs ultimately made it to an album. Embryonic was their chance to dump a lot of their ideas into something less focused. Dense and initially overwhelming, this is an album that rewards repeat listens, especially for those who appreciate experimental rock and hypnotic rhythms. <laughs> Jake Fridman pushed us and challenged us and, and made us rethink all the ways that we were, I don't know, that we thought we were good at before, maybe things that we thought we were comfortable with. But I think after making 13 or 14 records, I don't think we'd be satisfied um, with just trying to remake one of those. We don't want to make the Soft Bulletin again, or Yoshimi Battles the Pink Robots again, or do, you know, uh, anti-war psychedelic drug rock songs like we did on the last record. Embryonic is both a masterpiece and an enigma. While the rest of Neo Psychedelia was opting for brighter, warmer, and more melodic interpretations of the genre, the Flaming Lips were producing kraut rock with a generally apocalyptic atmosphere. With influences ranging from Joy Division to Pink Floyd and Miles Davis, it may feel like a 70-minute stream of consciousness. Could this have been cut down to one record? Probably. But to really get it, you just have to sit and listen. <laughs> Even though there's more than an album's worth of notable material, it's an evolution that might have alienated some of the more lush face fans, who probably felt a little left out on this one. But it certainly piqued new interest as it became the Flaming Lips' most successful album in the US. From here on, the band's biggest fault might have been being too experimental. Things got a little strange when the Flaming Lips started bringing in their friends. The same year Embryonic released, The Lips collaborated with the band Star Death and White Dwarfs, as well as singer Henry Rollins, to create a track-for-track -track reimagining of Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon. An excuse to release something for a record store day? Sure. In 2011, The Flaming Lips embarked on an ambitious endeavor to release new content each month. First, they introduced Two Blobs F***ing, a track divided into 12 pieces on YouTube designed to be played simultaneously. This is a test to make sure all units are in sync. Throughout the year, we also got a number of collaborative EPs with the likes of Neon Indian, Lightning Bolt, and Yoko Ono. There was the Gummy Song Skull EP packaged in a 7-pound Gummy Bear Skull. The Gummy Song Fetus EP packaged in a bubblegum-flavored Gummy Fetus. There was the 6-hour track featuring Sean Lennon. Then a 24-hour track available for purchase as a hard drive encased in an actual human skull. Only 13 copies were officially made. Then in 2012, we saw the release of the Flaming Lips and Hetty Fuentes, an amalgamation of the tracks from 2011's various collaborations, including new tracks with the likes of Tame Impala, Nick Cave, Bon Iver, and Kesha. And for Record Store Day, you could purchase the limited vinyl run that included the actual blood of some of the collaborators encased inside. Later that summer, they outclassed Jay-Z by performing eight live concerts within a 24-hour window, securing a place in the Guinness World Record books. And to round off that year, they took on another reimagination project, King Crimson's in the Court of the Crimson King. By now, some of the band's most dedicated fans began to worry that their heroes had become a gimmick factory that occasionally made music. There had been no lack of Lips content, but it was almost four years since we'd gotten a proper studio release. They were slowly becoming overshadowed by a new generation of artists who were producing more frequent and focused projects. The cold, alienating embrace of the terror retains embryonic, spontaneous, and loose feel, but takes a bold shift towards a more electronic and ambient style. 
The band is truly trying to capture a mood and atmosphere on this record, but it's a depressive one, and likely has the least pop appeal from anything they've previously released. And it's because the heart of this record lies in Steven Drott's personal struggles. At a time of relapse and isolation, Drott's experiences were powering the music's melancholic tone. It was an outlet for his mindset during these trying times. It was Wayne Coyne's decision to lean heavily on Drott's creative direction to craft an album with a sonic signature that they hadn't explored yet. So while the album is dark, there is a beauty in its bleakness. Overall, this dark experimental period for the Flaming Lips can be viewed as a necessary detour, an exploration of a sonic landscape that they hadn't previously ventured into. It reinforces the band's reputation as fearless innovators, something that is both a strength and a weakness. While it showcases their versatility, it has also alienated fans who loved a particular sound, or overwhelmed casual listeners looking to pin down the essential Flaming Lips album. And we don't ever think of it as like there's a Flaming Lips sound. I mean, the sound is, you know, it's just whatever we want to do. It right. just, that's just what we do. Even though, um, you know, Shimmy Battles the Pink Robots record, you know, that's over 10 years old now. And the Soft Bulletin's a quite old record. You know, they're always with us. They're always sort of part of our, who we're about. It's easy for us to sit there and say, well, we're not, we don't need to make another, do you realize? We don't need 10 of those. We have one. It's fine. We probably couldn't come up with another one even if we tried, but we don't really try. So this other, you know, when we're exploring music, it's like, it probably wouldn't be very satisfying to us if it all was similar to that stuff. Mm -hmm. And so we go places we haven't, haven't explored before. And the experimentation didn't stop there. They soon did a reimagining of the Stone Roses self-titled record, a collaborative cover of the Beatles' Sgt. Peppers, and released their instrumental Christmas album titled Atlas Eats Christmas. And then they met Miley Cyrus. The Flaming Lips would help write and produce a large amount of Miley's fifth studio album, Miley Cyrus and Her Dead Pets. It's a messy mix of left field pop tunes. Some great, but a lot more not so great. At 23 tracks and over an hour and a half in length, the record is tough to get through. But if Miley were going to choose anyone to make a self-indulgent psych pop album with, I guess the Flaming Lips wasn't a terrible choice. People would probably think she's this um, music industry, uh, Disney Corporation manufactured uh, persona, and what would we have in common? But I'm old enough not to give a f about all that stuff, and she's young enough and brave enough and experienced enough not to give a f at kind of about the same level. You know, anybody that's been doing stuff for a long time, I mean, to welcome some new freaky an adventure is, is wonderful. But this venture towards the pop realm seemed to have rubbed off on the band, because their next phase would be a return to a mellower and more conceptual sound. In Oxymelody, the lips make a nostalgic journey back to some of their more iconic sounds. The lo-fi orchestration of the soft bulletin, the sunny soundscapes of Yoshimi Battles the Pink Robots, even the robust fuzz of Embryonic. Yet despite all of these callbacks, Oxymelody is its own mellow thing. Doing, you know, a lot of stuff with Miley Cyrus and listening to a lot of, you know, being subjected to listening to a lot of her favorite music and uh, being around her producer Mike Will and stuff like that, that you, you know, you, you become immersed in it. Track sail through ambient, slow, and somber synth rock tunes that are the brightest the lips have sounded in over a decade. But generally, the album feels like it strips away a lot of what makes the Flaming Lips such a special group. For example, the band's usual bombastic drums have been replaced by boring, programmed beats. So while it is audibly pleasing, the majority of the track list, especially the second half, feels barren and lifeless. Castle. But the Flaming Lips career has been defined by their ability to bounce back, stronger, and more inspired. King's Mouth is the band's maiden attempt at a full-fledged narrative record. Remember, Yoshimi doesn't really count. King's Mouth was a concept conceived as a soundtrack to a synchronized light art installation of the same name by Wayne Coyne. It was an exhibit that had a king's head large enough for people to step into. 
The entire album chronicles the life of a space king, from his mysterious birth and extraordinary childhood to his sacrificial death and enduring legacy. And the king saves the day. It's a pretty far out and theatrical concept, and adding a touch of classic rock royalty, Mick Jones from The Clash graces the album as its narrator. The king is dead. Cut off his head. An artistic resurgence for the flaming lips, King's Mouth looks to reach for the same magic of Yoshimi, in concept and composition, and is just another example of the flaming lips doing whatever they want and modestly pulling it off. I think for songwriters, any creative people, you really do embrace this idea of having somewhere to go. And I think the, the, the idea of the King's Mouth and the coloring and the vibe and all this stuff, I think, led us to this type of music that's part of it is kind of medieval Baroque or something. And part of it is kind of futuristic and it comes from Mars. American Head marked the Flaming Lips' third studio album in a mere four-year span, the fourth if you factor in the Deep Lips collaboration from the year before. Hey, maybe the group saw King Gizzard's output over the years and thought to quicken their pace. Conceptually, the band embarked on a journey of introspection, shedding light on their American heritage. This is the Flaming Lips' take on Americana, a bit of a country influence wrapped in their classic, sentimental, neo-psych sound. The result is one of their most approachable projects to date. If you were waiting for an evolution on the Lush Orchestral Trilogy, this is definitely worth your attention, and likely a potential new favorite. The songwriting fails to match the high bar set by the instrumentation, but American Head should give fans a renewed appreciation for the band's ever-evolving artistry. So why don't we talk about the Flaming Lips enough? Drawing from their winding journey, it's clear that they're a paradox in the music world. A rare blend of passion and experimentation has rendered them both iconic and at times enigmatic. In the early 2000s, the Flaming Lips had precious few challengers for most beloved neo-psych band. But over the last decade, things have changed. While they have had their fingers on the pulse of musical evolution, they've also danced to the beat of their own drum often leaving audiences intrigued, bewildered, or lost in their wake. To be in a band is really, it, it really encompasses all the great exaggerated elements that is art. I mean, you can, you can look any way you want, you know, and that's kind of a statement. You can sing about anything you want. You can sound any way you want. And, uh, you know, that's a powerful thing, you know. Um, now you can make videos. You know, uh, you can make your own movies. Um, you know, it really encompasses just about everything there is in the arts. And you can sit there and say, this is me using all these different things. And so I think that's why I was drawn to rock and roll to begin with. Because I really come at this whole thing as just being a guy who loves music. People like watching a guy trying to do something. Now, whether that's climbing a mountain or trying to get to the moon or just trying to express himself. You know, I, for some reason, people admire that and I'm glad that I pick something that I can really get enthused about. So I don't know, but I think all art is great. Whether it's the weight of their vast projects, the shift of generational interest, or their unpredictable sonic transformations, their relative obscurity in music conversations is a bit of a mystery. But as we've seen time and time again, mainstream recognition has never been their focus. The band's essence is in the bold, the unique, and the unconventional. So what will the Flaming Lips do next? Simple. Whatever the f*** they want. That's a gummy bear skull. That weighs seven pounds. But inside there's a brain, and inside the brain is a USB flash drive thing that's going to hold these three songs that we're going to release in April. And we're going to release a little video later that shows you you have to eat into the brain to retrieve, to retrieve the music. Um, now you've probably never done that before. No, no, no. 